Okay, welcome to this first introductory lecture on uh, information security applications. Uh, you are going to attend this course at least for the beginning uh, part of the semester uh, online because of the COVID-19 measures. Um, you are supposed to read very carefully the syllabus that you find on uh, ISIS because uh, there you find all the instructions uh, about uh, how this course or this, this module, I should say, is organized and uh, how uh, you will uh, pass uh, the various uh, steps uh, of a uh, portfolio exam and finally get the final score and the final grade. Um, also, uh, I want to say that uh, I will uh, post uh, material, uh, exercises with solutions for you uh, as we proceed with the theory uh, for the first part of the course, because the first part of the course is passed with um, um, a test, a written test. I don't know yet how uh, are we going to organize this, because precisely because it's a little bit... Uh, up in the air, we have to see if we go back to normal or if we, we do the whole semester virtual. I will uh, also uh, probably organize uh, sessions since we do not have uh, physical office hours and a strike student in the, in the office. Uh, we are going to have uh, uh, video video conferences, maybe with Zoom, or uh, I have to see how, such that uh, you can ask questions and uh, uh, we can go through uh, the solutions of the problems together so you can verify if your level of cooperation is good. So without further ado, uh, today I'm going to go uh, through a sort of overview of uh, what is information theory, and what you're going to learn in this course. Huh? So what is information theory? Um, well, uh, we all know uh, that uh, today uh, we use uh, daily communication networks uh, for streaming media, to communicate with other people, uh, to post our content, uh, share content, uh, store content in cloud centers. So, we live in the so-called information age, and all this information age is built around a common big infrastructure, which is in fact a composite of many parts, many segments, many, many different networks, which is called internet. And somehow internet, the internet protocol, uh, is what keeps everything together. But uh, it was not always so. Uh, if you look back in time, uh, just a few decades ago, we had uh, very different networks to, to carry very different type of information sources. For example, telephone to carry voice, telegraph to carry some sort of very primitive digital information made of characters, uh, AM, FM, radio to broadcast information from one point to many receivers, analog TV, etc., etc., etc. So. These various systems are like uh, engineering responses to, to, to some needs, uh, and they were essentially heuristic approaches. So heuristic approaches means, okay, I have a problem, I try to find a way to get over it, and uh, I'm a smart engineer and I find a solution. But essentially, those approaches really lack of you know, a fundamental understanding. Uh, fundamental understanding is what is information? What are we trying to communicate? How do we represent information? And how do we reliably transmit information in space, so from point A to point B, and in time through storage, uh, through a storage medium? So all these problems were somehow addressed on a purely theoretical basis by um, an American mathematician, uh, Claude Shannon, working at Bell Labs, that in uh, the 50s, so 1948 is the date, uh, the publication year of this first paper, basically 
lay down the fundamental understanding of uh, the behind these problems, which is what is now we call information theory. So, in this paper, this is the title of the paper. You can see uh, mathematical theory of communication. It appeared in Bell System Technical Journal in 1948. Shannon basically. Uh, considered several several things, but in, pra in, in this is one of his most fa famous figures, and uh, it's figure one, is a sort of prototypical communication system where we have an information source uh, that generates what we will see later, messages that can be represented in bits. These messages are encoded by a transmitter into a signal, some waveform that is able to travel through a physical channel. The physical channel consists of some deterministic part, for example, a transfer function of a communication line or a fiber optical or a radio channel, and some randomness, typically modeled as noise or interference. So the received signal here is a distorted version noisy distorted version of what was transmitted and the role of the receiver is to somehow decode the information message and provide this information bit to the destination which will then use them to represent the original information source so for example if here there is a human talking well this means that the source consists of a human speech, this is digitized, it has to be encoded, it's turned into bits, and at the end here we have a microphone, and here there is another human listening, okay? Good. So, well, it turns out that a, a very simple but very uh, useful model for an, an information source is simply a sequence of IID random variables taking values in a specific alphabet. I use this notation, eh, capital letters for random variable. Indices indicate time instance. So this is a random process, a sequence of random variables indexed by some index that we, we call time conventionally. In this case, it's discrete time, one, two, three, four. It's a discrete time random process. When these random variables, they all follow the same probability distribution over the alphabet X, well, we say that this is an IID sequence. Right? That is the simplest possible form of random process without any form of a statistical dependence or correlation between one symbol and another. So for such a source, uh, Shannon defined a quantity that uh, we call the entropy of the source. And this quantity is given by this formula uh, that you can see can also be written as minus the expectation of log E sub x of x. So is the, if, in other words, Intuitively, the idea is that a symbol carry, carries more information when it's very rare to appear. For example, imagine that I have a counter that counts rare events. Most of the time, the symbol is zero, 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 which means nothing happens. Sometimes, blink, you have a one which means that a very rare event has happened. For example, a photon has come into uh, your counter or a radioactive particle has been counted. Okay, so these are very informative events. And it turns out that therefore information is somehow related to the inverse of a probability. So the more probability is large, the less information uh, the event carry. The more rare events or small probability, more information. But in fact, it's not the inverse is the logarithm of the inverse, log of 1 over the probability of a symbol, okay? So minus logarithm of the probability. 
And then the entropy is the average amount of information. So we take an expectation, so we sum over all possible symbols and multiply it by the probability of the symbols, and therefore we get to do this work. Okay? And this turns out to be the right uh, quantity, because we will see why it has a very clear operational meaning that uh, captures the amount of information per symbol generated by an information source. Now, if you apply this definition to a binary source, so zeros and ones, so the alphabet X, calligraphic X, contains only two symbols, zeros and ones, and I plot the entropy as a function of the probability of one, which is this P here, well, I have this chart, and if I use logarithm in base two here, so when I, every time in information here I use log, means log base two. Otherwise, I will lose LN to indicate base E or log base 10, log 10. Uh, anyway, you see here that when we have equiprobable zeros and ones, so when p is equal to 0.5, we have exactly one, the entropy is exactly equal to one. Entropy is measured in bits. Bits means binary information units. So an equiprobable sequence of zeros and ones carry exactly one bit of information per symbol. Okay? Now, what is the meaning, the operational meaning of entropy? Well, it turns out that if uh, I consider now very long sequences, very long sequences of length n, uh, um, of generated by the source, and then I look at the, what sequences are actually likely to appear, and what sequences are very unlikely to appear, it turns out that the whole probability mass concentrates over a relatively small set, and this small set has a size exponential 2 to the n times the entropy. And this is called the set of typical sequences, is the typical set. It means that the when n becomes large, the source is likely to produce sequences in this set and is very unlikely to produce sequences outside the set. Okay? For example, if you have a source that produces ones with probability 0 0.1, well, we know that the entropy is here is about 0 0.5. Huh? So we are going to have 2 to the n times 0 0.5 is the size of the typical set, but the size of the whole possible set of sequences of length n, binary sequences, is 2 to the n. Now we see that this set is exponentially smaller than this set, because the exponent is this one, which means that uh, if, you, uh, if you take the, the the ratio goes to zero. Eh? It means that it has a vanishing size, a relative size, which means that in a certain sense, we can simply index the sequences that are likely to appear and forget about the rest. And this, oopsie, this was terrible. Oh, yo, 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 yo. Okay, next step. Uh, and this is the, um, the, 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 the the foundation of data compression. Uh, what is data compression? Well, you have a file, and you click zip, and you make it small, right? And these, you don't lose anything. I mean, when you expand the file, you get exactly the same bits, the original bits. So how this can be done? Well, it can be done because the file is not made of equiprobable zeros and ones. You know, you have ASCII characters, you have who knows, whatever, you may, may have a lot of long sequences of zeros, a long sequence of uh, constant characters. So there is some sort of correlation of redundancy, which means that effectively uh, we can take uh, algorithms that maps the, the, the given file into a much shorter sequence of almost equivalent zeros and ones, which is equivalent to say that, well, we actually associate associate an index to 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 the, the, the file when it's typical, and we just discard it or whatever. 
uh, we don't even bother to represent when it's non-typical. When it's non-typical, the, the probability of appearing for this file is essentially impossible. It's essentially, essentially zero. So it turns out that, uh, well, there are algorithmic ways of doing this. For example, the most famous is uh, the so-called Lempel group algorithm that we will see, uh, which is, in fact, uh, the basis for um, uh, you know, the, the compression of files that you have on your computer. Uh, and uh, and basically, uh, this allows us to compress data without losing anything. This is called lossless data compression. And what is the the size of uh, of the compressed file? So uh, uh, how much we can compress? Well, if we associate an index to every typical sequence, we have two to the n h of x typical sequences. How many bits I need? Well, I need log base two of this to represent uniquely every typical sequence. So I get n times the entropy. Now, if I divide by n, so, so I'm interested in uh, the rate of compression, so the number of bits per source symbols, then you see from here, we are going to get the entropy. So it turns out that there is a theorem that we will prove that says that the entropy of the source is the best rate, so it's the smallest rate smallest amount of bit per symbol at which we can compress the source without losing anything. This is called lossless data compression. Now, second problem is channel coding, is how we transmit information through a noisy channel. And a channel is a random transformation, as I said before, it has an input x with an output y, and the relation, in general, is some form of complicated distortion plus noise plus who, who knows what, but it can be represented by a probability uh, transition from x to y. So the y is related probabilistically to x. And it turns out that I can abstract this problem as follows. Imagine that uh, I take long sequences of the input and transmit the sequences one symbol at a time through the channel, at the output, I have a long sequence of observation variables. So the, of, of the output, I have a long sequence of x. This is transmitted by, uh, to a long sequence of y. And now I can work the following problem. OK. Uh, it turns out that there is a set of typical sequences at the output, which has the size two to the n times the entropy of the output. And the channel is not likely to generate anything outside for the same reason we have said before. Only typical sequences are likely to appear. Now, what happens if I consider a typical sequence x? Well, it happens that the channel is likely to generate a set of sequences which is called the conditionally typical. Given a typical x, the set of conditionally typical output given this x has a size which is 2 to the n times something called the conditional entropy of y given x. And this is a quantity that I haven't introduced, but we will see, of course, uh, when we introduce all these quantities formally. So now here is the idea. Well, what we can do is simply partition the set of possible outputs, so partition this big set, into smaller disjoint sets of size equal to 2 to the n times the conditional entropy, and then associate to each of these disjoint sets one input that generate these sets. So this will be a code. In fact, a code book is the set of all possible, of all, of all sequences at the input that generates the sort of disjoint bubbles. And then I can ask myself how many messages I can, I can transmit. You understand that if these bubbles have no intersections, then in general, a decoder can recognize what message was transmitted. For example, if I see a receive signal here, well, I know that this comes from 
this input, if I see um, uh, 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 something here, I know it comes from this input. So I can uniquely undo the noisiness of the channel. And this means error correction. I can recover the original information. So the question is at which rate this can be done, at, at which number of bit per input symbols I can transmit information in a, such a reliable way. And then a simple count is, well, take the size of the whole typical output, divide by the size of the bubble. This is the maximum number of bubbles that I can pack into the, the typical output. And this difference is called the mutual information between X and Y. It turns out that this is the maximum number of messages that can be reliably transmitted. And therefore, again, taking one over n logarithm of this quantity, we end up with the fact that the, the mutual information is the best rate we can transmit. And in fact, we can maximize this over the input distribution. And this is called the channel capacity. So we will prove a theorem, which is called the channel capacity theorem, that says that there exist codes with vanishing probability of error at rates up to this number C, given by the maximum over the input probability distribution of the mutual information. While if I want to transmit a rate that is higher than this number, these codes do not exist. And in fact, what happens is that if I want to transmit a rate higher than capacity, basically my system cannot be reliable. I cannot control the probability of error. And in fact, in most channels, in most typical channels, what happens is that if you try to transmit, to transmit above capacity with uh, long codes, the probability of error on the code word becomes one, which means that almost all messages are wrong, okay? Are de decoded wrong. So, we will see some applications of this. For example, we will see how these ideas can be applied to wireless channels, in particular multiple antenna channels. Uh, we'll talk about wow, super sensitive. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the MIMO channel capacity. MIMO means multiple input, multiple output. And this gives, of course, MIMO technology that uh, we see today in uh, systems like the LTE, in uh, IEEE A02.ac, and uh, of course in uh, the so-called 5G new radio, where MIMO technology is widely used and is directly taken from information theoretic ideas. This was developed in the, uh, I would say, late 90s, early 2000, and then it took like uh, about uh, 10, 15 years to go from the theory to the practice and finally have these ideas incorporated into standards. And this is why we can now communicate at uh, rates, uh, bit rates that are were unthinkable before because uh, basically thanks to this multiple antenna technology, we can somehow multiply the bandwidth of a channel times the number of antennas. It's a little bit like that, okay? So it has this sort of multiplicative effect of uh, incapacity. Then the third problem, the third fundamental problem that we are going to see in uh, in a in this first part of the course, talking about information theory, is the problem of source coding. So what is source coding? Well, there are some sources that, that cannot be represented without losses. If you have a file, so it's a sequence of zeros and ones, uh, or a sequence of ASCII characters, so it's a discrete alphabet, then the entropy is well defined, we can compress to the entropy, as I said before. But if we have a video, for example, uh, an analog source, voice, video, audio, whatever. Well, normally what, uh, what we do, well, we have some acquisition system, uh, so a quantizer, uh, a CCD, or, 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 or a microphone, something that digitizes the video or digitizes the audio. And then 
uh, these already incur some losses, right, that are unavoidable in the acquisition process, but uh, normally the raw video or the raw audio are, are, are represented with a lot of bits, so a lot of bits per second, uh, and then you compress. Right? When you compress, then you have a trade-off between uh, accuracy for distortion and bit rate. I'm sure that you all have uh, direct experience of, say, MP3 or uh, MPEG-4. Well, when you compress a video, whether, whether it's more compressed, the quality is less, but the bitrate is, is smaller, the size of the file is smaller, so it depends, right? So the question here is, what is the best trade-off between accuracy and rate? So in general, we can define uh, again, a, a, the original source sequence X and a representation, a representation X hat, and you can define a so-called distortion measure as a sort of distortion per symbol incurred by representing X with X hat. For example, square distortion, when we just uh, normalize per symbol square error, or Humming distortion is a normalized number of differences. Mm -hmm. Those are all distortion measures, and there are plenty of uh, different distortion measures. Anyway, for a given distortion measure, uh, the question is, uh, what is the best rate to represent a source at that given distortion? And again, the answer is the mutual information. Surprisingly, well, we can argue as follows. We have a uh, set of typical source sequences. Now we can look for, for every for every um, x hat. Well, there is a sort of a bubble of this dimension entropy of x given x hat of typical sources, typical source sequences given x hat. So now what we can do is to cover the whole typical set with these bubbles. Now, these bubbles can have intersections, but you see, if I make them too overlap, it means that I need many bubbles to represent my source. So I want to make them covering everything, but with the least possible overlap. The problem is similar, but not identical as before. Anyway, the answer is very similar. At the end, what is the, the, the smallest number of uh, uh, bubbles I need to use to cover the whole set? Well, it is given by the ratio of say, the, the size of the typical set divided by the size of the bubble. And again, this difference of entropies is the mutual information. And now we have this theorem that says the best possible rate to represent a source at a given level of distortion D is the minimum of the mutual information over all distributions p x hat given x with that assigned average distortion. So this is the source coding theorem. And now data compression, channel coding theorem, source coding theorem, they form really the core of, let's say, classical single source or single destination information. Um, and this is what we are going to see in the first part of this course. Uh, just to let you know, these ideas translate directly into algorithms. Uh, for example, image coding is a typical example where we take a, a natural image, we transform it in a domain that is particularly useful for quantization, for example, the wavelet domain. Then we quantize the coefficients. And we use you know, uh, different uh, quantizers depending on the, the different subbands. And then when we have quantization symbols, and those, those symbols are then entropy coded. So the whole, the whole thing behaves very close to the limits given by this formula. Okay? Now, after exhausting these three subjects, we are going to turn our attention to problems that involve many sources and many destinations. Uh, 
so problems of networks. So we go from point to point, single source, single destination, to network information. And in general, these problems are much more difficult. There are a lot of open questions, but we are going to see a few prototypical network topologies and problem formulations for which we have nice satisfactory answers. And those answers are actually very useful also for applications. So in general, for a network, uh, we have what is called a capacity region. For example, if I have a network with uh, two source destination pairs, well, there will be the rate of user one, the rate of user two, and the capacity is not just one point like before, but it is a region where I promise I will improve. There is a region of rates that are achievable, and this means that when we are inside here, there are schemes that can transmit reliably at rate R1, R2, and when we are outside, this is a forbidden region. If I want to operate, for example, here, well, these schemes do not exist. It means that I cannot guarantee small probability of error for both users. Okay? So the general problem here is to determine the capacity region for a network. And these problems are pretty complicated, as I said. So we are going to see, um, we are going to see in particular a few prototypical uh, uh, networks, in particular the so-called multi-access channel, which is a many to one. Uh, we have many independent uh, users transmitting independent information through a channel that has a single output and there is one receiver who, which is interested in decoding all the user's messages. Uh, so imagine, for example, that this is the, the uplink of a cellular system. We have the base station and we have uh, several phones, right? Uh, and now this phone transmits in the uplink. And well, this is exactly the model that, uh, that uh, represents uh, this problem. Now you can see that all the stuff that you may have uh, studied in communication or networking courses with the multi-access protocols like CSMA, Aloha, TDMA, FDMA, all these things are ways of doing this uh, transmission, right? For such that several users can share the same uplink channel. And we will see, in fact, you know, that, that there is an information theory formulation for this problem, and there is an information theory optimal region of rates, or capacity region of the multi-access channel that we can actually characterize, and this problem is completely solved. Then we are going to see a sort of dual problem when we have a single transmitter that wants to deliver different messages to different users through a downlink. So here we have our base station, for example, and now again the phones, but now this is a downlink. So this is going to transmit, you know, messages to the users. And this problem, surprisingly, is much more difficult, but under certain conditions, we can also give um, the capacity region for this problem. Um, we're going to look at a uh, the case of interference. The case of interference is, for example, we have you know user one that wants to communicate with access point one, user two that wants to communicate to access point two. Let's say this is you know this is your home, this is your neighbor home, and uh, these two access points are on channel eleven, like a typical, and then basically they start colliding like this. Yeah? So you have crosstalk, collisions, uh, interference, and this problem is studied here is called the interference channel and he, for this problem the, the, in general the solution is not known the capacity region is not known but for the Gaussian case which is uh, somehow representative of a sort of wireless interference we can say a lot of interesting things and in fact uh, many things are known many, uh, a sort of approximated capacity is, is, is known um, Another model that we are going to see is the so-called relay channel. A relay channel is uh, one transmitter wants to communicate with one receiver with the help 
of a relay node. And the role of this relay node is not to inject more information, it's just to help as much as possible the communication between the transmitter and the receiver. And this is again a pretty open problem in general, but for in certain cases, we know quite a bit about uh, relay channels and more in general, more complicated uh, scenarios that are called relay networks, where we have one source, possible multiple destinations, and we have uh, intermediate nodes that will help to relay information. So, you know, the most general case is where we have uh, all these models uh, together. So we have uplink, downlink, uh, relays, uh, they are all mutually interfering. And of course, these problems are generally quite open. And here is where information theory uh, may give good guidelines, good ideas in terms of system design, but a full characterization of the capacity region for complicated network is still uh, pretty much a hopeless problem. So in conclusion, um, we can say that uh, information theory provides a rigorous mathematical framework at the basis of the modern information age. It started with uh, Shannon's paper. Since then, a lot of theoretical scenarios and problems have been solved. The information theoretic approach provides guidelines for efficient system design, insight in how a system should be designed. And this led the technology development of you know, the evolution in cellular, the evolution in Wi-Fi, uh, DSL modems, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, compression schemes, uh, source coding schemes uh, that we use every day. Uh, on a more philosophical level, uh, we can say that today we have the so-called convergence of uh, communication networks because everything is over IP. We have voice over IP, video over IP, etc., etc., etc. And where where is the origin of this concept? Well, the origin of this concept is precisely in what Shannon found. Shannon found that information has a common nature that can be represented in bits, and therefore. If we can convert any information source into bits, and then we have an efficient way to carry and store and, and transport these bits, we can have a single network that today we call internet, on which any source can be uh, can be can can uh, can be transmitted. And this is exactly what what is going on today. And this is why we can stream video over the same infrastructure, or which we do emails and we do file download. And, and et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, uh, we can conclude by saying that uh, there are many fundamental problems that uh, remains to be solved, especially going to complicated networks, but the theory is powerful enough to have uh, provided significant insight and significant progress, which is in fact at the basis of modern communication systems, modern wireless standards like 5G and all whatever is used today, even now in computation problems, data centers, uh, large data storage systems, etc. So this ends this uh, lecture zero. It was just an overview. I want to say that uh, this course is uh, quite mathematical, it has a strong mathematical flavor. So. From the next time, we are going to be much more formal with definitions and uh, theorems and, and proofs. Uh, this overview is very general, it's very high level, and uh, somehow gives you the flavor of what we are going to see in this course. I will give you some more overview when we go, uh, when we proceed around the course, because as you will read in the syllabus, the course consists of a first part, which is theory, and then a second part, which is projects. Projects will be based on research papers that will be assigned to you. Every student gets a paper, and the, and the goal is to read it, understand it, explain it, prepare a presentation, and uh, uh, if possible, also uh, maybe do some little MATLAB or Python implementation to reproduce
sum of the results, and then a final oral presentation with slides and questions. Okay, thank you for your attention.